All right, hi everyone. Welcome to my YouTube talk. We are going to do Carl Rogers. I hope this is for UNISA students. Um, it may be helpful uh, for others, but probably mainly for UNISA students. Okay, so if you like it, please click like and subscribe. You're also welcome to share. There's a link to my website in the description. And um, I recommend that you go there. And also, of course, that you do read the textbook because I don't know exactly what we're going to be tested on. Okay, so Carl Rogers. When I look on websites dedicated towards counseling and on Facebook groups, I mainly see quotes from Carl Rogers. Um, counselors still love him very much and listen to him for insight as to how to work. Okay, so he's well worth understanding. And in fact, if you engage deeply with the theory, you do get a deeper sense of the work. Um, both as a counselor and as someone working on themselves. Okay. So I'm hoping this will enrich it a little bit for us because I don't know about you, but I'm finding UNISA can be very dry and that I can end up studying just for the exams rather than to actually learn and engage with the material. It's not easy to get excited just about a textbook. A textbook is normally the most boring and least interesting thing. And multiple choice doesn't really help you to engage with the content and the meaning. Okay, so let's see. Okay, here are the practice questions, which this comes from your assignments one and two in UNISA 2021. It may be different in different years, but I assume if you can answer these, you will do okay in the exams. So you can guess your way through or you can study your way through. Okay, here's a two minute video on empathic listening, a uh, lecture by Carl Rogers. Okay. okay, now he was part of the humanistic phenomenologi phenomenological school of thought, phenomenological. What this means is Understanding a person's inner experience of reality. Understanding a person in terms of the meaning they give to themselves and to the world. Each of us lives in a different reality. My reality is different to yours. My sense of self, my sense of what is right, what is wrong, what is easy, what is difficult, what is enjoyable, is all very different to yours. Okay. So phenom phenomenological, phenomenological means the subjective experience of the person. Okay, so the, he is a humanist and part of the humanism is phenomenology, phenomenology, okay? Part of his humanism is phenomenology. Phenomenology is the subjective experience of self and the world. Constructive potential is the next assumption, that people have goals that shape their actions, feelings, and thoughts, that we are all building ourselves, and we have the potential to create something new of ourselves through what goals we set for ourselves. So it's all about intention and choice and self-empowerment, really. And the other thing is that people change. We can change ourselves for better and for worse. We have autonomy and we have that power. Okay, so people find it easiest to change and to reach their true potential when they are unconditionally accepted and they are free to develop. This is this famous quotation. The curious paradox is that when I accept myself, just as I am, then I can change. While I'm judging myself, criticizing myself, rejecting myself, uh, seeking to control myself, I am not free to change. I'm in conflict with myself and I'm not free to change. 
Okay, a short biography. He was born in 1902. He was part of a conservative and devout Protestant family who moved to a farm. His father practiced scientific method. So he was a mixture of conservative Christianity and scientific lineage in his upbringing. Um, he was a quiet, sensitive child. He was often bullied or teased as a youngster. He started studying theology in 1924 um, but found the College of Theology where he was studying quite conservative and it told him what to think and how to think and he decided to move away from that. So he changed his major to psychology and he obtained his PhD only within six years in 1931. He worked until his death at the age of 85 in 1987. In the last 15 years of his life, he worked around the world in places of conflict, including South Northern Ireland, South Africa, Brazil, Philippines, and many, many other countries. He was happily married for 55 years. Carl Rogers in South Africa. Okay, for many decades, there have been person-centered approach-based workshops held in South Africa based on his work. And they started in the 1980s. He came here in the 1980s. And some of the last years of his life were spent here. This is a five minute video. Um, listening to it, you can hear just how far we have come in South Africa from the past and what huge changes have happened um, for us. Okay. All right. Basic beliefs about human beings. Okay, so again, remember we've got um, we've got the three assumptions. Three assumptions were phenomenology, phenomenology, subjective experience of self and the world. Two, constructive potential. People have goals that shape their actions, feelings, and thoughts. Three people change. But of course, we have to say the environment is a big factor. If you have an adverse environment in which you are not free, you are not free to change or to achieve your goals. Who you are becomes constrained and difficult, and this can be very painful. Okay. And lead to illness, anxiety, and sadness. All right, here is the essence of what you need to learn. If you learn the key concepts, you've got it, okay? If you've got the key concepts, it should be a walk in the park to pass, I hope, um, and you understand the heart of what is in this little chapter in our textbook, okay? Once you've got those, everything becomes doable. So let's start running through them together, okay? Number one, self-concept. Self-concept means the self, which you could say is the perceptions and meaning associated with the self, the me, the I. Two, phenomenology. Remember, study of human experience, okay, that focuses on the subjective experience of how a person perceives and experiences the self and the world. Phenomenal field. The individual's reality, subjective reality, including themselves and the world. So it's like the field of everything they're aware of is the phenomenal field. Self-esteem. Esteem means to value. So self-esteem is how do you value yourself? Okay. Personal judgment of whether you are worthy or not and what you're doing, whether it's good or bad. The ideal self, the self you would like to be, okay? The need for positive regard. This is about getting uh, the positive opinion of other people about you. It's a basic need to be accepted and respected by other people. Self-actualization. Actual means real. So 
to actualize is to make something real, to create or manifest something. Self-actualization is the fundamental tendency of the organism to actualize, to maintain, to enhance itself and fulfill its potential. A concept emphasized by Rogers and other members of the human potential movement, such as Maslow. Okay, this is very similar to Maslow, self-actualization. Actualizing potential. Okay, so basically it's not like you self-actualize and then you're finished. It's a process. It's a constant process of growth and self-enhancement. That is what self-actualization is. It's not a destination. Okay. Conditions of worth. All right, this is important and tricky. Okay, what happens is other people give you conditions of worth, especially parents and teachers, but also your peers and society at large. If you do this, you are good. If you don't do it, you are not good. Okay, or if you don't do that, you are good. And if you do that, you're bad. So these can be defined as standards of evaluation that are not based on one's own true feelings, preferences, and inclinations, and are instead based on others' judgments about what is good or bad, conditions of worth. Congruence. Rogers' concept expressing an absence of conflict and discrepancy between the perceived self and experience. Also, you need to have congruence between the client and the counselor, the therapist, so that you understand one another and you are in harmony together. Incongruence. The discrepancy or conflict between the perceived self and the experience. Okay. So, for example, I might want to um, be a successful career woman. Um, and I think I'm very good at um, having a career. But my actual experience is that I'm constantly stressed because it actually doesn't suit me. And so now I'm fighting with myself. I'm like, why can't you get this right? Um, you should get it right. And I refuse to acknowledge that I'm totally overwhelmed and stressed. That's incongruence. Self-consistency. An absence of conflict amongst perceptions of the self. Okay, or you can have self-inconsistency as well. Um, so if you've got peace and harmony between the different perceptions you have of the different aspects of self, that's great. If you're trying to be um, generous and charitable in one part of yourself and you're trying to fight to the death in another part of yourself, you're going to have difficulties with reconciling those different aspects of self. And that's self-inconsistency. Distortion. Okay, when... What happens is when you don't want to see reality because you can't get it to be congruent with your sense of self, you distort it to fit what you wish it was. Um, the more distorted, the more unwell you are, okay? And the more out of the truth, out of authenticity, out of integrity you are because you're not being honest with yourself, okay? You are actually being dishonest with yourself. This is what distortion is, and it's not comfortable, and it's not healthy, and it does not enable growth, okay? A lot of people nowadays have problems with distortion because of social media, because there's a profound inauthenticity to our social construction of self. Um, this is a picture of what somebody does to their appearance to make themselves look right in social media. You could say this is literally a distortion of her image, her self-image, okay? Mm. Although with distortion, according to Rogers, she would be unaware of it. Whereas here, of course, she has created the distortion quite intentionally. Um, but her sense of who I am, who I am, who I really am, may actually also get distorted and most likely will from the beauty standards to which we are exposed. 
subception, a process emphasized by Rogers in which a stimulus is experienced without being brought into awareness. So a lot of Rogerian person-centered therapy is about bringing into awareness the feelings that are there that you're not allowing yourself to notice so that you can work with them while they are not in awareness you cannot work with them subception okay they're there but you don't notice them denial a defense mechanism emphasized by both freud and rogers in which threatening feelings are not allowed into awareness same meaning organism okay he'll use the word organism a lot this means person or other living being to remind us that we are biological entities with biological drives and needs, okay? Pre-intellectual understanding of the self. So, so it also refers to what you really are, not just your idea of what you are, differentiated. Okay, this is a word that you'll see used quite a lot in Carl Rogers, meaning to become distinct or specialized to acquire a different character, to make distinctions, to discriminate. Okay, so um, as you as the fetus evolves, it goes from a bundle of cells that are all the same into nerve cells and muscle cells and bone cells and brain cells, and it differentiates. Okay, uh, differentiation also happens during evolution, as maybe one species becomes two. So here it's about saying the self is different. To the environment and the self becomes differentiated it becomes a separate thing to the environment differentiation internal frame of reference a person's own desires thoughts feelings and phenomenological field okay Phenomenological, phenomenolo phenomenological, <laughs> okay. Symbolization. In social cognitive theory, this is the ability to think about one's social behavior in terms of words and images to symbolize. For Rogers, consciousness or awareness is the symbolization of some of our experience. It's a symbolic representation, not necessarily verbal, of our consciousness so he often uses symbolization to mean awareness or consciousness okay to mean that you've got it in your head you're grasping it self-structure how self-knowledge is organized all right how you um structure your conception of yourself organismic self the true self, the total sum of a person's experiences and predispositions on all levels. Okay, and we'll talk about the organismic or true self when we're talking about the ideal self and the self-concept later on. Organismic experience. Okay, that's what the organism experiences. Visceral feeling. This is important. Visceral means guts. That's what it means. It means the intestines, actually. That's the viscera. So when something's visceral, you feel it in your guts. A visceral feeling is intuitive. There might not be a rational explanation, but you know what's best by listening to what your body is telling you. A visceral feeling. Gestalt. Okay. Gestalt in German means the shape or form of something. But gestalt in psychology is also the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And gestalt in psychology is also very interested in perception and the way that we perceive, how we perceive, how we create meaning, how we put together our experiences of the world. So here are examples of the gestalt laws. We did them in PYC 2501 or 2502. Anyway, um, this is how the mind perceives. Okay, 
So those words are all important um, and a good idea to memorize them. Right, let's look at the 19 propositions. These are the key assumptions that underlie his theory and his practical work with clients. They are important and they are very difficult. Um, so let's work on it. Now, we start with a direct quote. And then I've given you a little summary in bold of simpler language just to get a handle on it. But you'll notice that no matter which summary you look at, because there are other people's summaries out there, the original is still very valuable because of its complexity and condensity. So none of the little things in bold will really do the original statement justice. Okay, so let's see. Every individual exists in a continually changing world of experiencing of which he is the center. Okay. So everyone is part is the center of their own reality and it's a continually changing reality. Okay. The organism reacts to the field as it is experienced and perceived. This perceptual field is for the individual reality. Okay, so we're constantly reacting to our own little subjective universes that we're in, each of us in our own universe. Okay, and we think that's real. For me, this is my reality. Okay, number three, the organism reacts as an organized whole to this phenomenal field. That's quite easy. So I react as a single being. Okay, here's a short six minutes explaining some of the vocab in the first proposition. Um, yeah, you might find it useful. Okay, number four. A portion of the total perceptual field gradually becomes differentiated as the self. In other words, part of my reality is my sense of self. So what happens is you get a little baby. The baby doesn't know that it's a baby. The baby doesn't know that it's a self. For the baby, it's just experiences. There's no difference between me and the world. Self and other. I'm just experiencing the world in a state of wonder. As the baby grows, the baby starts saying, oh, this is me, and this is not me, okay? So that is um, proposition number four. Okay, number five. The structure of self is formed, resulting from interaction with the environment and from the evaluation of others. This is a Organ this is an organized, fluid, but consistent conception pattern of perceptions and values and relationships of the eye to the environment and to others. This means I create a sense of self from the environment and according to others' opinions. This is fluid, but it's also stable. And I see my own identity in terms of my values. Am I good or am I bad? Am I hardworking or am I lazy? Am I beautiful or am I ugly? Am I a boy or am I a girl? The organism has one basic tendency and striving to actualize, maintain and enhance the experiencing organism. This means you have an innate desire to grow, thrive, and learn. Best vantage point for understanding behavior is from the internal frame of reference of the individual. This means you need to understand someone's behavior from their point of view. This is an important one, I think. A, a major breakthrough in understanding someone is to go, is to as much as possible stand in their reality and know what it feels like to be them as much as you can. So in listening, you're also changing yourself. 
just by listening. We'll come back to that later. Okay, number eight. Behavior is basically the goal-directed attempt of the organism to satisfy its needs as experienced in the field as perceived. Okay, people act to meet their needs by setting goals and acting with those goals as they perceive them, as they see them, okay? People make choices based on their needs and their goals, and it fits together for them. In their reality, it makes sense. Perhaps in our reality, it doesn't, but in theirs, it does. Okay. Emotion accompanies and in general facilitates such behavior. The emotion is related to the perceived significance of the behavior for the maintenance and enhancement of the organism. Emotion drives and goes with behavior. Emotions are about personal needs. If you want to understand someone, you need to understand it from their world, basically. And when you do, everything they do will make sense. The values attached to experiences and the values which are part of the self-structure in some instances are values experienced directly by the organism and in some instances are values introjected or taken over from others but perceived in a distorted fashion as if they had been experienced directly. Okay, so some values come from inside the organism. Nobody has to tell you that ice cream is delicious. You just know it's delicious. Other times you take it in from others, but you don't even notice that you've taken it in from others. You've never experienced it directly, only through what others have taught you and shown you, okay? As we live, we build up a picture of ourselves called the self-concept from relating to and being with others and by interacting with the world. Okay, this um, explanation, there's a link to the original source there, and um, that might be helpful. Sometimes we believe other people's version of reality, and then we take in their values as part of our self-concept as if they are our own values. We don't even notice that we're doing it. It's, it's spontaneous. Okay, number 11. As experiences occur in the life of an individual, they are either symbolized, perceived and organized into some relationship with the self, brought in to your reality, ignored because they're not relevant, or C, denied symbolization or given a distorted symbolization because the experience is inconsistent with the structure of the self. You cannot reconcile it, so you have to twist it before you can accept any part of it. This means, as I have experiences in life, I can relate to them as relevant to me, ignore them, deny or distort so that they fit into my reality, okay? If I think I'm uh, clever, I will explain bad exam results by saying, oh, it's UNISA. They made it so difficult. They don't ask me right. They make it wrong. That's why I got such low grades. Not because I didn't uh, understand the questions. Okay. Okay. Number 12. Most of the ways of behaving which are adopted by the organism are those which are consistent with the concept of the self. Meaning, most of what we do matches with who we think we are. Okay. But number 13, on the other hand, behavior may in some instances be brought about by organic experiences and needs which have not been symbolized. Such behavior may be inconsistent with the structure of the self. But in such instances, the behavior is not owned by the individual. Um, this means that sometimes we don't understand our own behavior because we haven't recognized our needs and essential nature. And in such cases, we might not even recognize that about ourselves. 
This happens to people throughout your life as you age. So um, there's a shift in behavior that comes about before you've conceptualized it and you may not recognize it happening um, until a while later you catch up with yourself. Okay. 14, psychological maladjustment exists when the organism denies to awareness significant sensory and visceral experiences. which consequently are not symbolized and organized into the gestalt of the self structure. When this situation exists, there's a basic or potential psychological tension. So maladjustment, things go wrong. When we don't allow ourselves to see or to notice important experiences that are happening, then we don't put it into our heads. We don't bring it into words and concepts. And we don't bring it into our sense of what's going on for us. And this causes basic discomfort. It feels bad. We don't feel okay when this happens. Okay. So we've got reality that we're not bringing into our understanding. And this makes everything feel awful. Um, this will happen with people who come from upbringings in which they have been uh, misperceived possibly, conditions of worth have been set that cannot be met, um, people also who've had um, shocks and traumas that they don't know how to integrate, um, people whose beings are socially denied, like transgender people I think in the past, and gay people and also in the present, of course, but far more in the past, where nobody, they didn't have any way of conceptualizing what was going on for them, and it must have felt quite dreadful, okay? I don't think this is an uncommon experience for humanity. We are all quite strange and wonderful and often battle to find ourselves, especially in youth, when you're still growing and creating an identity the major building blocks. Okay. Um, right, 15. Psychological adjustment exists when the concept of the self is such that all the sensory and visceral experiences of the organism are, or may be, assimilated on a symbolic level into a consistent relationship with the concept of self. Meaning, when what is happening for you is brought into your sense of self or can be, you will be in a state of ease and integrity. Okay. And you'll feel good, you'll feel whole, you'll feel alive. Number 16, any experience which is inconsistent with the organization or structure of self may be perceived as a threat. And the more of these perceptions there are, the more rigidly the self-structure is organized to maintain itself. Okay, meaning when things don't fit with our sense of self, we feel unsafe. The more unsafe we feel, the more we cling to our identity and the more we can't take any threat to it because we're really holding on to it so tight. Okay. 17. Under certain conditions involving primarily complete absence of any threat to the self structure, experiences that are inconsistent with it may be perceived and examined, and the structure of self provides to assimilate and include such experiences. This means when we feel safe, we can take in experiences that challenge our sense of self and reality. And then we can actually change our self-concept and worldview to be more inclusive and accurate and whole. Okay, so it's a constant challenge to expand ourselves. But in order to do so, we need to feel safe. Number 18. When the individual perceives and accepts into one consistent and integrated system, all his sensory and visceral experiences 
then he is necessarily more understanding of others and more accepting of others as separate individuals. Okay, so when you have your a sense of self that's integrated and that can absorb reality and work with reality as it is, it's easy to accept other people as quirky and different to you um, and understand them because they don't threaten your sense of self as they would if you didn't have an integrated, flexible and um, inclusive sense of self that is in harmony with the world. Okay. Number 19, finally, as the individual perceives and accepts into his self structure more of his organic experiences, he finds that he is replacing his value system based so largely on interjections that have been distortedly symbolized with a continuing orgasmic, organismic valuing process, okay? So instead of constantly internalizing everything that goes into your head so that you now believe that you should have a Rolex watch and you should wear a suit and you should be thin and this color and this shape eye and do this job and think this way and whatever, you just are yourself, whatever that may be. So this also can be said, so you receive true values and you receive falsehoods. So it's very much about integrity. Okay, there's a little um, revision test for the key terms. Theory of personality, a little three and a half minute summary. The structure of the personality. There are three structural elements to the personality. The organism, the phenomenal field, and the self-concept. Remember, the organism is the living being, the true self. The phenomenal field is the personal subjective experience of reality, including the self. The self-concept is my self-image, what I think I am, okay? The gestalt of the I or me. Okay, so this isn't always completely in consciousness, but you can bring it back, you know, like, yeah, I'm one of those people that likes licorice. Yes, I wasn't thinking about that a moment ago, but now I know, yes, I am. And that is neutral, I suppose. Um, but most, there's a lot of values, you know, licorice is neutral, but say, Yes, I'm one of the people that likes chocolate, and that's not very good. Okay. Incongruence is deeply uncomfortable for a person. The self-concept, the ideal self, and the organismic self are different and may be at odds. So my ideal self is slim and gorgeous. My real self is plump and likes chocolate. My self-concept is that I'm greedy, okay? Now I'm definitely not a happy person. All right. The three are different. There's incongruence. In a psychologically healthy person, there's congruence between the self-concept, the ideal self, and the organismic self. Okay. Mm. So then you would say, okay, I'm a bit plump and I like chocolate, but that is a simple fact. And then you've got congruence. Okay. They're all the same. My ideal self is a bit plump and likes chocolate, and I know that I am a bit plump and I like chocolate. Okay, so it all fits, no problem. The dynamics of the personality. What drives the behavior and how does the personality work? So dynamics meaning the movement of, the way it flows and develops. Okay, so what drives behavior? Number one, the actualizing tendency. The basic drive to grow, to thrive and be the best you can be, okay? So um, self-actualizing would just be relating to your self-concept like, um, 
how you perceive yourself, but real actualizing would actually be not just about how you perceive yourself, but looking after the organism as well and tweaking the ideal self so that it continues to help you grow and be comfortable in your own skin. Okay. Um, so actualizing tendency, then there's a need for positive regard from people around you. You want people around you to think highly of you and to value you and to give you love and a positive gaze, a kind gaze, a compassionate gaze. The need for positive self-regard. You need to think highly of yourself. You need to be compassionate and caring towards yourself. These are the basic needs that drive behavior. They may not be in harmony. So you might make bad choices because you want other people to approve of you. The values we take on from other people are, remember, conditions of worth. These can lead to incongruity. Okay. So we've got denial and distortion. Okay, here is um, here is a short excerpt from one of Jordan Peterson's lectures. Okay, um, they're fantastic. I recommend watching them. They're great, and for Eric Fromm as well. I mean, sorry, Victor Frankl also. And there's a whole series of lectures which I'm going to be exploring. I've just discovered them last week. So they're, they're exciting. This is well worth doing. Okay. Self-concept and experience. All right. Here we are again. This is the same thing we talked about earlier. Experiences may be ignored. Or they can be symbolized and brought into consciousness. Or you can refuse to symbolize it. Um, and push it out of your mind. This is called subception, so that you are, it's happening, but you're not aware of it. Uh, this is often where psychosomatic illnesses come from. Like here she is um, possibly refusing to symbolize sexual desire. So she has it, but she's not acknowledging it. So she's manifesting as a fainting spell in order to get all that lovely attention from this handsome young man. Okay. Here again, it's a revision of the key terminology. Okay. The development of the personality. Babies start life undifferentiated and without a self structure. Gradually, they learn how to meet their needs. Then, over time, especially through interactions with others, they form a self-concept. We are social beings. Our self is formed relative to others. And then over time, you add meaning to your self-concept according to your experiences and according to the meaning and roles that other gi others give us. Okay, development of self-concept is formed by two key factors, unconditional positive regard. This is a very important therapeutic quality. Acceptance from others exactly as you are, so you are free to be whatever you can be. Okay? Now, you don't have to accept everything about a person to give them unconditional positive regard. You can criticize their behavior. It's not going to destroy them. You just need to know that you accept them for who they are. Okay? Conditional positive regard. Um, this creates um, conditions of worth. So, oh, there's a good girl. That's very good. That's very bad. You're not a good girl if you do that. That is conditional positive regard. It's not good for people. It turns people into little, it takes people away from their authenticity and also takes people away from finding out who they really are. Okay. Optimum development. Optimum development is a process. There's no ending to it. It's a continuous thing, okay? You don't get to a point when, oh, you're not optimally developed. You are able to continue to learn, okay? So a growing openness to experience, 
there's six conditions, I think it's six or seven, growing openness to experience, an increasing tendency to live each moment fully so you are fully alive. Increasing organismic trust, trusting yourself and your intuition and the feelings within your body. Freedom of choice. Maybe making the wrong choice, maybe the right choice, doesn't matter. At least you can make your own choices for yourself, not for others. Creativity. Basic reliability and constructiveness. Because people are basically good, when they are actualized, they are benevolent and trustworthy. And number seven, a rich, full life. Psychopathology. Okay, so again, we are deeply helpful when we risk ourselves as persons in the relationship, when we experience the other person as a person in his or her own right. Only then is there a meeting at the depth that dissolves the pain of aloneness in both the client and the therapist. In other words, we don't help people when we put labels on them. We help people when we actually connect with them deeply. So psychopathology for Carl Rogers is from incongruence. In from people not being true to themselves, giving rise to maladaptive behavior and to anxiety. It threatens the self-concept, gives rise to defense mechanisms. Remember, denial, distortion, subception, rigid clinging to a false self so that can lead you further and further and further and further away from authenticity. Um, he didn't like using labels, okay? Um, so it's not a whole theory, but it's a very useful theory. Psychotherapy. Person-centered therapy is what he created. Okay, here's a very nice intro to a movie, I think. It's lovely and well worth watching. Okay. Careful and attentive listening with little speech and much reflecting back of feelings you're hearing from the client. This is what person-centered therapy is all about, is these points, all right? This is how you help people as a therapist. Okay. So careful listening, lots of reflecting back as you, what you hear. Sorry, this thing pops up all the time. One moment. Oh. Hang on, I've got something popping up on my screen. Just give me one moment. Sorry about that. Okay, so listening deeply and reflecting back what you're hearing so that the client can correct you or confirm, so that you actually confirm that you really understand what's happening. Often also listening for the feelings that are underneath what you're hearing. So you ask very delicately so that the client can easily correct you. If I understand you correctly, her criticism is hurtful to you. Is that correct? then the client is very comfortable about telling you yes or no. Okay, it can be used in education and commerce. The client takes responsibility for their own change. We don't call the person a patient, but a client, because it's all about empowering them. The therapist is then a facilitator for their journey, their experience. Um, unconditional positive regard, warmth, and empathy are an essential part of the therapeutic relationship. The client needs to feel free and safe. You are transferring, actively transferring power from yourself to the client. And you're creating a climate in which the client can grow. Okay, and you do this through one, sincerity and congruence, being yourself and being visible. Don't hiding, not hiding yourself, not pretending to be an expert not acting aloof, not being intimidating and professional, just being yourself, keeping it real. Unconditional positive regard, caring and accepting and looking 
compassionately into the life of your client. Empathy, listening for feelings and being aware of them, even those the client may not be conscious of, and also listening always for your own feelings. Courage is a prerequisite for empathetic understanding because listening deeply asks that you change, that you grow, that your sense of reality is altered to take in that information that your client is sharing with you, that wisdom that they have to offer. And observing from the client's frame of reference, stepping into their world and their reality, which is very different from yours. Okay, here we have an amazing video. I really recommend watching it. Um, there are many recordings of Carl Rogers during therapy. They're all quite long. This is the nicest short one I could find. You'll see it's not always perfect. Sometimes it's very uncomfortable to watch some of his work. Um, that is also interesting. You know, he's just a normal guy. Um, it's not like he's always going to be a perfect therapist in the recordings. It's quite interesting to watch. But this one, I think, is, is really amazing. Okay, aggression. Okay, so if you take Carl Rogers' theory and his understanding of the world and people, yes, there's a lot of aggressive and evil behavior. No, this is not inherent in human nature. It's a product of a harmful environment from birth onwards. Healing takes place in an understanding and accepting atmosphere. When a person feels safe and whole and has, and has reached a state of integrity, personal integrity, there's no need for aggression. If you really understand a person, their capacity for and choice to be violent will make perfect sense to you as it does to them. So, you know, this is probably true, actually, even for sociopaths and psychopaths. Um, only a tiny fraction of such people go on to commit violent deeds. Um, so you can't say that it's inherent to them. Perhaps it's not true. Because sometimes such people act simply out of self-interest. And I did read somewhere that most people respond well to a call to be true to themselves, but in the dark triad personalities, it's narcissism, sociopathy, or psychopathy, Machiavellism, it actually worsens them because they act more horribly because that's them being true to themselves. So there's a big question mark around this, but it has, uh, we'll look now now. So here's the amazing Jordan Peterson. The last 20 minutes are a deep investigation of this moral and psychological question, philosophical question. So that's wonderful, I recommend it. Here's um, assignment questions you can use to practice and memorize. Bum, ba -dum, ba -dum. There they are. This is the video I wanted to talk about. Um, this man was extremely violent, he came from a life of extreme suffering, and, it's, and he's now a therapist. Uh, it's very profound and shows you what the magic and the wonder and the, the alchemy of compassionate um, listening and therapeutic intervention can bring for a person, even a person who seemed to be so bad, so frightening, so dangerous. Okay. His true potential is far greater than what he initially seemed to be. Okay. So that's the end. I really hope it helps. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please go to the website and watch these videos. They are actually well worth it. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye.